the least risky thing you can do to live a fulfilling life is to take risk. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about risk and how it plays a crucial role in living a fulfilling life. This was such a good episode with a lot of wisdom, and it will definitely inspire you to take more risks in life. Our guest today is Alan Ying. Alan Ying dropped out of the cardiothoracic surgery residency program at Duke University to start a software company when he was 28 years old. Since selling that business, he's enjoyed leading, investing, investing in and serving on the boards of startups to public companies. Alan grew up in Ohio and now lives in Texas. He researches risk and is the co-author of The Risk Paradox, life lessons from 102 amazing risk takers. He is married and has three children. Before we begin, a quick reminder to check out the new 2023 Artist of Life workbook, our top selling guided journal to help you create your most intentional and successful year. You can find it at shop.lavendaire.com. All right, enjoy the interview. Hello, Alan. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great, Eileen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. So why don't you start off by telling us your story and how risk played a role in your major life decisions? I was a immigrant Chinese kid. You grow up, your parents tell you to do certain things and uh, certain things are expected and you don't have a lot of, I don't know, I didn't have a real big passion for anything. I ended up following the path, going to college, Uh, I went to med school, became a doctor. Um, Everything was going great. I would say that um, I was happy. I'm generally a happy guy. And um, I think I always had um, an interest in business that would poke itself out every now and then. Um, And I ended up starting a software company uh, after I had become a doctor during residency um, if any of your listeners, uh, in their age range, I'm sure they have, they know somebody somewhere who's gone to med school, they're in residency, they're complaining about the hours. That's the phase that I was in. Wow. And I was doing really well. I was actually okay with the hours. Um, and I just came upon this problem in, um, the work I was doing and, uh, I couldn't not work on it. And so it just ate up all the rest of my time. Um, and so I eventually quit being a doctor. I, I guess I'm wondering what what pulled you to quit your residency? Because it's, it's such a long process to go to med school and make it into residency in the first place. And to, to, be, to be able to leave that, like, can you give us more detail on like what you were pursuing? I think it's 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 been similar for a long time, but the greatest learnings that you have are when you get to your first responsibility, your first job, whether that's managing a Starbucks or, you know, retail or anything like that. My first real job was being a doctor (laughs) at a hospital taking care of patients. And I might be at the peak of someone else's image, but in that time and in that world, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. So they make you do all the stuff that no one else wants to do. The very specific thing was before there were iPhones, there were terrible computers and there was nothing mobile. Can you imagine not being able to pull up Google on your phone 50 times a day? Um, We had all of the lab results for all the patients we took care of at Duke University Health System. So the I was in heart surgery and it was the number one heart surgery place in the world. So this is the center of the universe. And my job for 40 hours a week was to go look at information on a computer screen and write it down on an index card. <laughs> oh my god! And if that isn't soul sucking, you know, ambition killing work, um, I don't know what is. I was okay doing it. I just thought it was dumb. And I I think a lot of people start off, they're in a job and it could be anything. And they're like, this should be dumb. This shouldn't be the way it is. And most people blow that off. And for whatever reason, or they just quit or they move on or they, you know, find a different job. Um, 
for whatever reason, I couldn't let go. I was like, there has to be a better way. And so I just looked for it. I didn't know anything about computers. I didn't know anything about business. I'd never seen a spreadsheet. I'd never seen a legal document. I'd never seen computer code. I didn't know anything. And so I just was like, I need to solve this. And that's how it started. Mm, Okay. How did you start the company? Was it just you yourself? Did you meet someone? How did you like, because if you had no knowledge, right? So I remember very vividly being in my 20s and not knowing how to do anything. When you are, when you go to college and med school and residency, you essentially don't know how to do anything else. So I was like, how do I solve this problem? And the only two things I knew was way back then, there was a really awesome device back then, but would be considered hilarious now. It was called a Palm Pilot, which was essentially a glorified calculator that was in your pocket that you could tap with your finger. I was like, okay, I want to make all of this stuff appear on this device that I carry around. How do I do that? And I just asked around. I asked people, I'm like, how would I do this? How would I do this? Mm. And people would have opinions. I'd try and find someone smart. And then I went on the internet and I was like, it'd be like the equivalent of Craigslist now. Hey, can anyone make computer code to do this? (laughs) And I found two stoners from (laughs) UT undergrad and it was straight out of a movie. It was like dazed and confused. They were like, yeah, dude, sure. That sounds awesome. You know, and how much can you pay us? It's like, man, I don't have any money. I was $300,000 $300,000 in debt, making $22,000 a year. So I was like, I need to ask people for money. And it started off with people who knew me and they're like, great, we're, we'll invest in you. Here's $1,000. Here's $2,000. And they said, we'd like shares in your company. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So <laughs> I would ask some other older person and say, what are they talking about? What are shares in a company? They said, you have to start a company. And it's like, how do I do that? And that was it. I mean, it was essentially, my life has been a long string of wanting to do something, not knowing how to do it, trying to find someone who I thought was smart, and then trying it out. Wow. And so after, like, guide us through the journey, like what happened at the end of that journey for the listeners who don't know. I started off, I took people's money, I gave them shares. I'll tell you this, there is something when you, when someone hands you a check and they say, I believe in you. um, And then there's a, I don't know, for me at least, there's a sense of pride or obligation or I need to do well, or I need to try hard. And um, so we worked hard. I raised a lot of money from you know, a thousand, two thousand. This was not a venture capital deal. It was a lot of small dollars for a long time. I would take the money, I would pay the programmers, <laughs> all of this while I was working in surgery. Then eventually I couldn't do both. I quit mm-hmm. being a doctor. I was paid nothing, sat on a milk crate in a friend's garage, and it was hard. There was a lot of times where um, we didn't have enough money in the bank account. And I knew people needed to be paid on Friday and it's Monday. And um, I'd make a lot of calls, try and be as convincing as I could, uh, get the money, be able to pay the people. That went on for a long time. Eventually, we we got to a customer. That's a big thing. I would say um, when I was 28, which is probably the age of a lot of your listeners, mm-hmm. I was so irritated when people who were older than me and they'd say, go get your first customer, Uh, go do this thing. And I would get so mad. I wouldn't yell at them, but I would be steaming. And I would think that's what I need the money for. Give me a lot of money and then I will go do this. And um, eventually I had to just scrimp along. And eventually we did get a first customer, beg, borrow, steal, create something And, you know, after all of that, when I was so mad, when everyone told me to do that, I think it was really wise. (laughs) They wanted to prove, they wanted me to prove that I wasn't going to give up. 
we were the only company, this is right after the dot-com crash. I know that's ancient history for all of you, but it was like what it feels like now, yeah. but worse with um, <sighs> just everyone thought the internet was fraudulent. Like wow. we're going back to paper. The internet. And a how fraud. long were and you? How long were you like working? You know, struggling before you got your first customer with this business. I mean, it was over a year. I was working at my surgery residency. Is it, it was 110 hours a week, and then I was working whatever number of hours um, on this at night, and then in between shifts. I'm sure you guys know people who have jobs out there. Your listeners, you're not doing stuff all the time. So I would just take all my downtime and I didn't have Reddit to browse on my phone. I just made calls to try and raise money. Yeah. So um, that was a year and a half. Uh, we got our first customer and then we were able to raise money. And then we raised $4 million, uh, which was a lot of money then. And it's a lot of money now. And um, it was a huge risk by these people because I, I still didn't really have any business experience uh, but they saw that I'd sacrificed. I mean, I'm I'm the age of my investors back then. But if I saw some kid drop out of, you know, the number one heart surgery program in the country in the world uh, for this thing that they believed in, uh, a I'd think they were crazy, and b I'd think, wow, they really believe in this. Uh, and then we were making progress. I mean, it did really well. Uh, we were the only company that was funded that year in the entire state to uh survive and then we grew it big and it was eventually the the largest mobile platform in healthcare uh and then wow. we sold it to um, a big company uh 5 years later 5 years later and so you're saying you got that big investment money during, after the dot com crash so like nobody was really doing well right uh, I'll tell you, everyone was out of any software and tech and no one believed in it. I just, I didn't know anything about economics or the stock market or tech or anything. I just believed in the problem that I was solving. Um, everyone was bundling, everyone was bundling, you know, all of technology in with the internet crash and my approach was I'm solving a real problem here. This doesn't depend on the internet or, yeah. or I don't know, um, the things that people were saying, the internet's bad. I was solving a real problem and I just believed in it. And um, I got the first, I got the check uh, two weeks before 9-11, which is how long ago that was, my first thing. And if it would have been a you know two weeks later, we wouldn't be having this conversation because everyone was spooked after yeah. that. Everything yeah. was shut down after that. So, you know, the lesson for me on that, for I tell pe young people come and talk to me all the time. Uh, I, I like to think I'm, I'm young, but uh, younger people is um, people are going to say no a lot. And if you're right and you can hang on, you can make progress and make it happen. Yeah. Love it. I mean, obviously it was a big risk. And even hearing like the macro situation that you built this company in, it feels like an even bigger risk, right? Because it's like almost, it's more difficult to find investors in that, in that situation. Um, yeah. So, so talk about like, did you, how, how did you weigh the risk or do you think it was just because you were naive that it worked out? Yeah. I will tell you that, um, one of the benefits, so, you know, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, millennials, et cetera. Now it's, it's a different world. It's really tough. There's student debt. There is, um, feels like everything awesome's already been invented. I don't know. Social media is eating the world. What do you do? Um, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. It seems totally crazy and overwhelming. I just started with what I knew to be true and what I could control. So I couldn't control the rest of the internet or the stock market. I couldn't control, I mean, we got into a war right after I, the country got into a war right after I got the money and no one in the country was spending money. So we got this money and we're going to have to go sell and the world shut down for like two years and it was, it was a nuclear winter. 
um, I would say it was naivete. And when you're younger, when you're 28, 30, you have a lot of energy and you have a lot of belief. And that can, that can get you through a lot. And it's not, it's not guaranteed that you'll win, but, um, that can cover up a lot of mistakes, uh, that can, that can, um, cover up a lot of wisdom that you don't have. I would say I pitched 300 times to venture capital investors, 300 times they told me this was a dumb idea. I don't want to, I don't want to put anyone out there and say, Hey, everyone go follow your dreams regardless. But what I'd say is when I was in that situation and I was 28 and it was really tough and I had something that I believed in, it mattered to me that I saw someone who was further along and had done it or could do it. And that gave me, um, emotional confidence. You know, it filled my sails and said, well, if they can do it, then I can do it. Uh, it's tough nowadays, right? Everyone's looking at, you know, whatever news report of some newly minted unicorn or influencer, or whatever. And it can seem really disheartening. Uh, what I'd say is that, um, there's a lot of emotional benefit on starting where you are with what you know. And if you believe in it, um, and you, and you know, you're right, um, it'll get there eventually. Yeah. I love that. I, I think that's a testament to truly believing in something and, and not stopping until like you see it through. And I think the fact that you lived that like the, the, the struggle, like you built the product to solve the problem that you struggled with. <laughs> and obviously a lot of venture capitalists, people who haven't been in that struggle, they don't see the problem. So that's why they think it's a dumb idea. But I think it's a, it's just a reminder to the listeners, like you might be able to see the problem because you're living it, but you, not everyone will believe in it. But because if you see it, like see it through, right? Yeah, I would say a, a lot of people are going to feel like that when you're in your 20s and 30s, you feel like you're in a dead end job or this isn't going anywhere. Or how am I going to end up on the Fortune 500 list if I'm doing this? I was I was working 120 hours a week, making twenty two thousand dollars a year. I think I calculated out, but I was making something along the lines of you know 15 cents or something ridiculous an hour. But I learned a lot. I got exposed to problems that were important and valuable. Mm. Um, a lot of times when you're young, the job says, uh, minimum four years experience of something. And, and it's like your first job and you're like, I need this job for the experience. Uh, every, every, every activity will be a learning experience. Uh, that's what I found out. It exposed me to, um, it exposed me to problems I wouldn't have done or have seen. Mm -hmm. And that, that gave me opportunity to say, oh, here's a problem I can solve. Yeah. And, you know, an outlet for my passion. So of which was to solve problems. Yeah. So ultimately it's, it's not that it was a waste of time. Like it, everything had, it, it led you to the next step. People ask me that all the time is like, man, do you feel, do you feel like you wasted all that time? It was four years of undergrad. It was four years plus an extra year of med school and then residency. Oh my gosh. I, I haven't, I haven't, after I left, when I quit, I haven't seen a patient. I've done anything in healthcare since. And, um, man, doesn't that feel like a waste of time? Well, you know, I don't know. A lot of other people go through their early twenties in some job where they're learning, you know, being an influencer or being in a consulting job or working in retail, et cetera. And then they end up, you know, founding some company or becoming a successful, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle influencer or something like that. I don't know. Was the first was were those eight, those eight years when you struggled, uh, you know, learning how to work hard and focus on a goal? Were those a waste? I don't. I don't think it was a waste. I think it was what made me. Yeah, I agree. I think nothing is a waste. It all leads you to where you're meant to go. Um, okay, so you eventually, so you sold your company. Why don't you lead us to like how you started to research risk? How and why? I sold the business 
when you're in your 30s, I sold it. I was really young. I mean, I sold it when I was 32, 33. And then the company that bought it gave me all this opportunity to see things. This is the great, the great gift that I got in life is I got to see what success looked like, what, what people perceive as success in the outside world. So I was in this big company. Uh, I was very well regarded and doing all these big deals inside all the closed rooms that everyone thinks, oh, that's where decisions happen. I just lucked into being in there because they spent all this money to buy my business. And I got to see what it's like to be at the top of the hill. So we're talking, it's not, doesn't seem like a big deal now, but like it was a $30 billion business. Um, you know, what it was like to be at the top and 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 run that we bought this company called Reuters, which used to be uh, you know the largest French news agency in the world, and that was the greatest gift I got. I got to see what it looked like to be what the world considered successful, and I didn't, and it wasn't for me. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I saw what it looked like for all these people to have more money than I could potentially ever I could even dream of having flying in jets, going to islands, having everyone carry your bags and do everything for you. And I couldn't find anyone that I was like, I want my life to be like that person. That was the experience that I got in my early to mid thirties. And so then I just made my life the way that I wanted. What I wanted was I wanted kids and family and time with friends. And, um, I, you know, I turned down a lot. They offered me the gig, uh, you know, the gig to run the whole company. I, I got offered that a couple of times, but it was going to require that I move my family or move away from my family or travel all over the place. And there were things that I wanted. It's not for everyone, but I just wanted to spend time with my kids. And so I said no to a lot of it, but then I was, I, I tried to make my way and, pursue things that were interesting. So I did a lot of things. I did venture capital, private equity. I had my own, my own investments. Um, eventually my passion ended up being that, you know, I'm just, I just like business and I became a really good investor and running of businesses. And the key thing for me was I didn't, I only wanted to spend time with people that I liked is what it got down to. Um, I didn't want to, there wasn't any amount of money that I was going to be, you know, spend time with people that I thought were terrible or I don't want to say they were terrible that I didn't want to spend time with. So I took a company public, I bought and sold, you know, an environmental services company. These are all, um, but it was always by spending time with people that I enjoyed. And I still, I have, you know, I still have a, a big business that, uh, that's in the healthcare space and uh, another company that's in the consumer manufactured goods space. And the main risks there was when you're 33, 34, 35, you're not sure who you are yet. And I had to make decisions about what direction I wanted my life to go when I wasn't sure who I was yet. There was risk there. I mean, I said no to all these big, I mean, I'd be the top guy at this huge mega company and all this money and everyone saying I'm the best and I didn't want to do it. And, um, it could have ended another way, but the way that I looked at it was, um, I have this thing before Jeff Bezos talked about it. I had this thing called regret minimization, uh, which is I try and pretend and think about when I'm old, if I'm going to regret this big decision that I'm making both ways. And it's been, it's been the most uh, useful thing I've ever done. So I figured I would regret not quitting the surgery program because I would always wonder what would have happened. I would have regret taking those jobs because I know for sure I would have missed a lot of time with my kids. And I didn't want to be 90 years old saying, man, I wish I, I don't know, man, I wish I would have spent more time with them. So that's, that's how I approach things. I just sit there and I think about if I'm going to regret it. 
Yeah, I think that's an amazing framework. And it's funny that you said that in your 30s, you didn't really know yourself. But to me, it sounds like you had values and you stuck to your values, like cared about family. And, and you know, I, I you did have something there. I think there is, there's a really tough um, process that I don't think anyone gets to skip unless they're just, you know, precociously wise. There's this phases of... Um, who you, who you think, you know, what you think you want, what you think you should want, what everyone tells you you should want. And then eventually you get to a place of what you really want. And I didn't get to skip any of those phases. There was stuff where it's like parents, you, you want, even myself, you want yourself to want this thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you want yourself to want this career, this job, this activity. You think you should want this job, this career, this activity, you know, and you go through all these phases where you think you should want it. You think you should want the job or the expensive car or fame or fortune. Uh, You know, maybe you go past that phase and then you find the thing that you really want yourself to want. You really want yourself to be a, you know, a transcendental meditation Buddhist or something, because then you can just say no to the world and you really want yourself to be that person. Um, and you just go through these phases where eventually, you know, for me at least, um, I get the self-confidence and the courage and the experience to, you know, eventually say, these are the things that I really do want. And then that gives, that's what gives you the the courage to make decisions. It gave me the courage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So how did you start to research risk? And when did you start working on this book? Like what led you to this topic? I'm interested in how people individually, but people in groups think and work. And I'm generally interested in this thing that we've been talking about, the compromises people make and what it takes to deal with the word success and money and income and cars and watches and houses and family. And that's what I think life is. And I've always been interested in that, um, how people navigate that. The co-author, my co-author, Doug, uh, he had, we had worked together at a prior company. Um, and he is not a risk. He's not a, he's not a classical risk taker. He's a more conservative guy. So we're two very complimentary pairs and he just would always bring up that I was, you know, the the decisions and the choices I was making just were, um, seemed so crazy. And mm-hmm. so like normal people don't do that. And he had, he had written a memoir and we just were talking about risk where it was like, well, I didn't actually perceive it as a risk. I mean, I remember saying that it was, I don't know. I just never thought of what I did as risky when I did it. And he's like, how could you not? It's so obvious. Like, that's crazy. Uh, And then we just started talking about it. And we actually looked for, to see if anyone else had done anything about this. Like, if you type into Amazon, if all your listeners afterwards right now on their phones, they type into Amazon and they're like, risk in life or risk or whatever, you're going to find a ton of books about like words that I don't even know what they mean around financial arbitrage Mm -hmm. and alpha, beta, gamma, and portfolio management and hedge funds and gambling and all this stuff. Uh, No one wrote about life risk in in a way that I thought was credible. You'd find Mm -hmm. the person who is the total daredevil, crazy person who, you know, I think would be crazy, right? Who's Alex Honnold or he actually, he didn't write a book, but whoever daredevil and they do really risky things and they write a memoir. Or it's someone, you know, the founder of FedEx, and he writes about how he took the last dollars in FedEx's account, went to Vegas and put it on black, and that's how he saved the company. Uh, Those are fun stories. They're not very relatable. And so uh, we're just like, okay, well, I learned from stories. Um, That's how I've ever done anything. I didn't learn to be a CEO by reading a book. I would talk with people and hear their stories. So he said, let's interview people get their stories who've done amazing things, uh, like crazy things, not crazy things, uh, things that someone who was not them would think would be, wow, that's very notable. And let's see what patterns emerge. 
we started it probably, we, we were thinking about it in 18, 19. And then we finished the interviews uh, the week COVID shut down the world. So we just finished the interviews um, and that was amazing. And then, you know, uh, we've been working on it since then. Okay. Yeah. So you had the pandemic time to write, actually write the book and put it together. Yeah, it was, um, it's, it's so funny. You talk about risk and we were just like, oh, well, we don't know where this is going to go. I mean, it was hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews of people with brand names of products that your audience knows. Um, and you know, we were like, man, I don't know what the pandemic is going to do to this. And then it turns out that, um, you know, it seems like risk is more topical and important now than ever with, you know, the great resignation or quiet quitting or whatever it is uh, that people are doing. Uh, what do I do for money? How important is it? Um, that's ultimately what the book was about was people who made choices and then what they found was important. Nice. Yeah, I, I do feel like since the pandemic happened, since we're kind of taken out of that normal routine, I think more people are open to risk and willing to take risks because the world is already crazy, right? Um, so what were the patterns that you found in your research? So it was 100, 102 people and it was 51 men, 51 women. Um, we were able to group them into bigger categories. So we ended up having six categories. Uh, and I think even if I just mention them, just the words themselves will make you think of, oh, I know someone like that. They were adventurers, you know, like risk junkies. They were seekers, people who are looking for meaning. Maybe that's germane to your audience. There are givers, people who are just want, they'll take massive risk, not for themselves, but to serve for others. others. Wow. Um, you know, idealists, people who, uh, I mean, maybe I, I, so it's funny, there's, we found that most people are primarily one and usually one other one. And, um, so I'm like an idealist. You see that the world isn't the way that it should be. And you're just going to take all this risk to try and make the world the way you think it should be. Um, so there were these six categories. So the patterns we saw were, um, there were groupings of people. So not all risk takers are the same. Um, there were some of them that were amazing. And I was like, wow, I could have, even when I was young and naive and 25, I couldn't do what you did. And I, that's not even interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> and so that was super fascinating. I, you know, no one's ever kind of grouped risk takers into categories. We yeah. actually created a, uh, a quiz to let people categorize themselves based upon the data. Um, I love that so much. Wait, so you, I think you mentioned four, just what are the other two? <laughs> uh, so what I said, I said adventures, you said uh, adventures, idealists, speakers, idealists, givers, survivors. Oh yeah. Survivors. Okay. So, you know, we probably all know someone like that too. You know, you're hanging out with them and you feel like you know them cause they're in your, you know, your yoga class or something and you go get a coffee and then you realize that they came from an abusive home. They were, they survived childhood cancer. They just had a really ter they almost died and, you know, had spent a year in the hospital or something. The survivors were incredible. I would say those were the most emotional for me where it was the stories. I was in tears, you know, a lot of the time because, so let me think here. So we had uh, survivor seekers. Let me just pull it up here. God, I should know the, the six categories. <laughs> There's one more. Uh, oh, liberators. Liberators. Okay. This is liberators. one that's really, really, um, that is very, very timely. So these are the people who don't want to be in a cube. They don't want to work for the man. They don't want to have someone tell them. I mean, maybe it's an influencer or someone who's like, look, I can make money and survive without having corporate America tell me that I need to button my shirt up one more notch or anything like that. So liberators was also super fascinating. They will, they just want to live their own life. So they're like in search for freedom so that they'll take risks for freedom. It's funny because when you mentioned these, I feel like I could relate to, relate to like two or three of them. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's what a lot of people are like, I, you know, if you, you know, when you take it, you know, people have taken it and it's, it's funny. There's, it's usually about two or three, right? And one, if you had to peg yourself, you know, people would say that's 
I'm probably primarily this. I could totally relate to those others. You know, I would say that I'm probably idealist and uh, liberator and mm-hmm. seeker is probably where, yeah. you know, where are mine, you know? And the funny thing is, is it's so fascinating when you, because, you know, whatever your profile is, you can see someone else. You know, there's a gentleman who um, who grew up wealthy, and just a good, good guy. And he just had this epiphany of, you know, what did I do to deserve this his entire life? Then he, you know, he's, he's, he's about service. I don't know if he's wired that way. And, mm. and he gets married. He, he's going to be poor. He's like, has come to grips with that where he's like, I'm going to do a nonprofit. I'm going to go work in the hood, you know, in like gunshots at night with his family and, And that's his life and, you know, workforce training for these fans. I mean, it was, and I look at that and I mean, I, I'll say it out loud. I said it that, I mean, man, they're, they're a better person than me. That's, that's not, that's not something I would take a risk for. Right. Right. But for these people, that's the giver. They totally do it. Is that the, yeah, that's the giver. Yeah. It it is interesting when you label them out and identify them. Cause yeah, for example, I, I feel like I'm also liberator and seeker, but I wouldn't, I'm not an adventurer. I don't take adventurous risks. I not with my body. No, <laughs> but I'll take risks for my freedom. <laughs> so did you find the reason for why people are a certain way? Is it just the personality way, way they're born? It's anything. You know, it's that? funny we asked, uh, so we, we went through and we would hear the whole stories. And then there was a couple, there's one question that we asked and it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's an unfair question, but we just wanted to see what people thought. Um, we said, look, there's, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. Science hasn't proven anything. Uh, we just want to know, um, nature versus nurture, which is the the Mm -hmm. thing that everyone will talk about, you know, give it a percentage of each, uh, and it can't be 50, 50 is basically what we told them. And everyone had to answer it. And, you know, it was a lot of hemming and hawing, Cause, but we said, look, there's, we're not going to doc. We're not going to, what I'd say is, is, um, you know, there were no clear patterns around adventurers saying, oh, it's just the way that I'm wired. Um, there were, um, overall there was, this is one interesting pattern overall. If you averaged everyone, it got pretty close to 50, 50 women actually. So we had a, we had some really interesting cohorts where we had a lot of super accomplished risk-taking women in these stories and where did they fit and what kind of risk takers they were. Women skewed, you know, significantly more towards nature. Like the way Mm -hmm. that you turn out is nature. Mm -hmm. And, and these weren't, I mean, these are very highly accomplished women and they're not, they're not any one type, right? The, you know, one founded one of the most iconic fashion brands, you know, uh, you know, in Paris Fashion Week, and one was a, a hostage kind of conflict negotiator. I mean, wow, you had uh, people running amazing. their own businesses. It was yeah. it was wide, but they skewed a lot towards uh, women. Skewed more towards nature as being the driving pattern. I don't know what it says. You know, um, we'll probably get more data at some point as we interview more people, um, but. Uh, it's a pretty significant set of folks as it is. Yeah. Oh, so you're continuing this research. Like, what does it look like now after the book is done? You know, uh, we'll see. We'll see, right? I I, I feel like um, I like people's stories. I find it so interesting. And I think we'd, I'd enjoy it, honestly. I'd enjoy it. I feel it. like those could be a podcast. It could literally be a podcast, each one a person's story, right? Right. It's... it's uh, you know, so it's super interesting. Um, this is my first book. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, I have, you know, I have, um, a lot of interest in it. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. So, so what is the paradox that you're talking about for risk? Cause the title is the risk paradox. Yeah. So the risk paradox, it was, um, so in short, it is the least risky thing you can do to live a fulfilling life mm. is to take risk. Oh, okay. Yeah. So here's the thing. The, the, the main thing is people get into a situation and they're like, oh my gosh, should I, should I step off the cliff? Should I make the leap? Should I do this? And it's, this is a risk and I could 
sure, something good could happen, but something bad could happen. Okay. And the things that you don't say are that, oh, if I do nothing, then I'm safe and everything will stay the same. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, my goodness, people in your, you know, in their 20s to 30s now, I mean, they lived through the financial crash. I mean, two financial crashes, right? I mean, 2008, mm -hmm. 2000, yeah. and now there's and a now. pandemic. There's, there's a <laughs> land crazy. war in Europe. The there world is, is crumbling. <laughs> and so, so yeah. you know, the, the thing is, is, but from the time that you're really young, the risk decisions are, and no one talks about it. They're, they just assume that if I don't do anything, everything's going to stay the same and I'm safe and nothing will change. And what we found is, is that is never the case. That's essentially, it's actually even worse where if you do nothing, things are going to change that are out of your control and that you can't mm -hmm. predict because yeah. you think everything's going to be the same. Right. And what we found was, is there's, there was no downside to the risk. Okay. So when we had these people, I mean, you know, this woman, I mean, it's, it's, she was a survivor, but I mean, pregnancy, ninth grade, I mean, ninth grade. And then, you know, abusive husband flees the situation. She ends up surviving and taking all this risk after all of this, where she ends up being one of the largest, uh, you know, really prominent tech firms in kind of like a, uh, it's almost like a Airbnb for, or, um, for jobs and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the Uber, Uber eats, but for businesses wanting to find mm -hmm. people working, she's just done such an incredible job. She got shown that the world doesn't stay the same. You think you're going to be, you're going to go to ninth grade and then you're going to go to 10th grade and you're going to take like geometry. <laughs> and so she got exposed really young that, oh, like the, life goes off course. So that's the risk paradox. It's basically understanding that taking risk when you go out there, I mean, that doesn't mean just go off and jump off a building or do dumb things. But when we're sitting there and we're all scrunched up and worried, and should I do this or should I not? You get through lots of things. Oh my gosh, why do I want to do this? There's money, there's whatever. I mean, there's lots of different things, but the baseline underneath all of that is if I do this, it could go well, it could go poorly. If I do nothing, I'm safe. And mm -hmm. that's such a critical thing that people don't think about. We, we were like, that's the most important thing. That's the risk paradox, that actually taking risk, you will learn, yeah. you will learn about yourself, you will learn about what's important to you, you will learn how hard you can work, you can learn how you're going to behave when things go well, and if you become a total jerk, and you're going to learn about if things don't go well and if, you know, you need help and if you're going to cave and if you really liked it. Yeah, basically you you're always going to gain something when you take a risk and if you don't take a risk, you think you're staying safe but actually you're like you're not changing, you're not growing, right? And and the world changes around you and you might be in an even worse off place than if you were to take a risk. Look, we didn't I didn't do anything. And Russia invaded Ukraine. <laughs> I didn't do anything. And there was a pandemic and the world shut down for two years. I, you know, reality in the world isn't going to, isn't going to be safe and the same. So at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these, we, we, there are some people in the book that were in their thirties, mostly were 40, 50, 60, seventies, you know, et cetera, but no one ever regretted it. I mean, there was a guy, mm -hmm. he, I mean, he almost, these people, they almost go bankrupt. They, they, their hair falls out. They, they have all these horrible things. And a hundred percent of the time they're like, that was really good for me. I learned so mm -hmm. much. I'm a better Love person that. for it. Yeah. Do you have advice on how to weigh risk? Like how to decide whether this is a good risk to take or not? So I'll get, so, so I'll say two things, my own experience, my own experience is that if I know what's the most important thing to me, it makes it easier. When, I'm, when I was younger, it made it harder because there were lots of other things that should have been important to me or that I wanted to be important to me. It's, it's money, it's a title, it's prestige, it's how people think about you. Even before there was social media, you know, when you're young, you think about what, is, what do people think about you? Are people going to be able to tell 
What do I want my car to look like? How do I want to dress? How do I want to present myself to the world? It takes a, you know, it takes a pretty meaningful amount of work in, in my experience to really say, okay, this is what's going to be important to me because you only tell how important something is to you when you decide what you are willing to give up for it. And so when you get tested with that, uh, you figure out what's really important to you. So that's my experience. It makes it a lot easier when, and by the way, it's not like, you know, I turned 18 and I'm like, okay, this is what's important to me. I'm going to make all my decisions this way. It's, I was naive and clueless and just like a golden retriever wagging his tail and, you know, into my forties. Okay. So, um, but at least I would try, I would think about it and, and of you know, am I going to regret this? If I could only have one thing and it's X number of years from now, which one would it be? So time is one thing. So one thing is figure out what's important to you. One tool that I use for that is I try and make myself look back on it with time. So that's one thing that's been really useful for me. That's the whole regret thing. Because the thing that looks really important now, I mean, if you really imagine yourself and you're like 75 or 80 or 85, like, you have to imagine yourself old and wrinkly and not able to do CrossFit and, you know, whatever. (laughs) Then you're like, oh, what's really important? Um, So that's for me. Uh, You know, out of the book, it's funny, the risks that people took were the things that helped them determine what was the most important thing for them. Mm. So there was one guy who had everything. He worked his whole life. He was was old by this point. You think they'd have it figured out. I don't say old. He's 50, okay? He's running a multi-billion dollar business that owns an industry. He has everything, his house. It's what you're going to watch on whatever cable channel when they're talking about, look at this mansion. And he had it all, you know, half a dozen cars, family, you know, all the money in the world, country clubs. I am not kidding. He just, he didn't have meaning. So he was a seeker. And he wanted to spend more time with his family. He, he, he had everything. And he said, it turns out this is not what I want. I have all these cars and this huge house and everything anyone could want. And it was a family business. I mean, he had a little bit of a leg up. The family business started out and he made it even bigger. And they, I, I don't even know if I could do this. They gave away everything. Wow. This 7,000 square foot house, all the cars. Um, and they just dropped out and went away and lived as a family in, you know, I mean, they had the financial means to do it, but they gave everything away and they lived in this little cottage, you know, for years. And then, um, change his life. It, the risk there, he did this. I mean, I mean, I'm sure the people at the country club or whatever thought he had gone off the deep end, but he was looking for meaning and his meaning was he wanted to bond with his family. He also risked his relationship with his parents because his dad was like, what are you doing? You're responsible for making this thing. And he literally drops out of life. And um, in order to find his meaning and what was important to him, he risked it all. Finances, like friends he's had for years, social standing, his relationship with his family. And so that's what I'd say. People use, the risk ends up helping clarify for people what's important for them. Right. You know, if people are facing a hard decision and you're young and you're like, oh, man, for this, I get, you know, I'll get a lot of likes or for this, I'll get more money or a better title or for this, I'll be able to work remotely. You know, that's a lot of stuff swirling around in your head. It takes a little effort. And maybe a lot of, I didn't know in my twenties of like, okay, what's the most important thing for me? What's the most important thing for me? You know, I need to be able to make rent. I need to, you know, uh, I want to be able to do what I want with my friends. I want to be intellectually stimulated. But then when you chip away at it, there's, you know, there's, you eventually get at something, you do the thing that satisfies a lot of them. And then you're going to get in a situation where you realize, oh, you know what? Turns out the title and the money wasn't worth it. I'd really rather work remotely. And you're like, oh man, I could get paid 50% more if they let, if I go into the office because that's what they're doing at this place. And okay, well, I'm willing to take less and live on in Montana or something. So 
taking the risk is what clarifies what is important for people is what we found. Yeah. Um, what would you say to the people who are feeling that fear to take a risk? Maybe they, you know, a lot of people hesitate and fear holds them back. It paralyzes them. What's your take on that? Yeah. I, so, so first of all, don't beat yourself up. It's the most natural thing in the world. Um, you know, you, you, people will hear this story and it's like, oh, he's, he's older. He's got all this money. He's got, done all this stuff. You know, it wasn't like that. It wasn't, <laughs> it's, it, you know, everybody, you know, who you think, you know, on, on the media or Instagram or whatever, and they have some big house or YouTube, like they have to take out the trash. <laughs> they are worried about like how their kids are doing. They're worried about what people think of them. Uh, so the fear is totally normal. There's a couple things. Steve Jobs said this, so everyone knows who Steve Jobs is. And I did this before, before he said it. He said it at a commencement speech or something. I think it was at a Stanford commencement speech. Um, it, it goes along with the regret thing. <laughs> he, he said this in a speech. He's like, imagine your death. That's what he said. I mean, it's not super uplifting, but he turns it around. But mm -hmm. his point was is, if you imagine that, then like it's easier to get to a point where you're like, man, what will I have wanted to do? What will I have wanted to have happen in my life? So what that does is it takes you out of the moment. The fear is caused by the thing in the moment. I mean, I, I was scared of Halloween when I was eight years old. I mean, Halloween, the movie, the old oh, classic yeah. movie. Okay. <laughs> um, but that scared, you know, scared the bejesus out of me. Um, you know, 30, 40 years later or whatever, I'm not scared of it at all looking back on it. But man, it was, my brother held my eyes open and made me watch Jaws when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I was scared to death of the pool, let alone the yeah. ocean. Oh, yeah. And, um, but now I look back on it, I'm like, ah, you know, that fear doesn't seem worthwhile, right? Or it doesn't seem worth it. And that's what the distance does. Mm -hmm. So if you can take your brain, you can take your heart. Steve Jobs says, imagine your death. And Jeff Bezos has his regret minimiza minimization framework. Uh, what I do is I take a, a hybrid of it. I, you know, for me, I give the distance as if I had already, I couldn't come back and influence it. I'd already done what I'd done with my life. I'm hopefully I have kids and grandkids and, you know, I can drink lemonade and watch them play. Okay. But I can't influence what's happening now. And so then I think, okay, what would I have been proud of myself? What would I have wanted to have happen? And, um, you know, it turns out that there's not that many things. Uh, what we found out of the, the risk takers is it's not like people were like, yes, I totally needed to have the bigger hot car or the, you know, the bigger house, or I'm most proud of my title here, or I'm most like, you know, it was a fairly small set of things after the whole, it was all said and done what they risked for. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was inner fulfillment and meaning yeah. and whatever spoke to them and, yeah. um, and relationships, you know, friends mm -hmm. and family and, and, um, and that was it. I mean, that was, you know, what we saw, but those are the tools I use getting distance from what I'm afraid yeah. of now. Yeah. Love that. Okay. Um, after you finished all this research, you've written the book, how, how has your life changed as a result? Like, have you made any changes based on what you learned? Maybe a mindset shift? It wasn't like we came into doing these interviews and saying, okay, we're going to write a book about this. We were like, let's interview a bunch of people who've done crazy things and see what comes out of it. We were about halfway through the interviews and it was, it was like, oh my gosh, this is it. It was an entirely original thing. It sounds kind of like a fortune cookie thing, but it was, wow, taking risk is the least risky thing you can do um, to live a fulfilling life. Um, now, look, it's not, the risk paradox isn't taking risk is the least risky thing you can do to optimize your 401k or, you know, I mean, it's, it's about a fulfilling life. And I will tell you that that has, it's, I'm, you've heard my, how I go about things. i I feel like I've, I'm not smarter than anyone, but I, I try hard to live a fulfilling life. That thing and how much you take for granted that 
things are going to take the same, t- be the same and not doing anything is not a risk. Um, that does make me think quite a bit, honestly. Um, even, you know, at my age and life stage, it's different than, you know, you or your listeners. The pace of change is really high. And when you're young, uh, it's so high. And the movement that you can take is so fast. And um, it's never too late. So uh, I would say that it's really, um, you know, I was, I was, I was doing okay. Uh, you know, I have a, my life I tell people is better than I deserve. So, um, but having that, honestly, the risk paradox itself. And the other thing that's lasting is, is, um, the people's stories. I really get a lot of value out of people's stories. The things, the things that you see on Instagram or on YouTube or the news or the magazine, it's, you know, it's one frame out of a movie of people's lives, you know, and when you get the whole movie, you know, even the heroes, you realize they've, it's, you know, it, it wasn't all up and to the right and they didn't, weren't, they weren't born on the cover of Forbes. And there's a lot of people who aren't on the cover of Forbes who have done amazing things. So, uh, you know, that's the thing, the stories stick with me. I really appreciate those. It affects me. I think about, I think about my life experiences you know, even mm-hmm. when I'm out and traveling, um, in terms of, oh my gosh, that person did this. And that's really inspiring. I mm-hmm. start actually, there was a, I helped a young lady. She started a business. She read the book. She read an early copy of the book and there's a incredible, actually a, a Taiwanese immigrant woman, um, who is such an inspirational story, just not knowing anything about anything and just really non-traditional. She ended up, she was she completely didn't want to be what her Chinese parents wanted her to be. And so she ended up going all these different ways and she wanted to be independent. She was liberator and, um, she did it and she started with nothing and persistence. And, uh, she is an incredible story. She owns surf resorts. Now she is just such an inspiration. Uh, that person actually inspired this other woman, uh, she's getting into the, the same field now around government contracting and, and business. So uh, I think the stories will stick with me. Yeah, I love that. So many good, inspiring people and stories out there. Um, another thing I want to share with you that's relevant is like one, um, I guess, mantra that kind of led me after I graduated college was one of my college professors said, you should take your biggest risks while you're young. Because while you're young, you you have more time to like pick yourself back up. If you fail, you have nothing to lose when you're fresh out of college. And so I kind of took that to heart, and that's one of the reasons why I I would I chose to take more risks rather than going like a traditional path <laughs> out of college. Yeah, I mean, do you want to speak on that, like age and time with risk? We have these things that are little fortune cookie mantras. We called um, you know in the book they're lessons learned. Um. So I remember, um, so the, the mantra is risk tastes different with age. And, um, the reason I thought about that, I've used that in my life actually, because the risk I took in my twenties and then in my thirties, you know, and then, you know, as you move every five years, um, I imagined like, I don't know, this butterscotch candy in my mouth and just rolling around and you feel it, you can taste it. And then it was like, oh, like I completely did not register it as risk at all in my 20s. Yeah. yeah. Never even crossed my mind, right? Um, and then I look at it now and it's just so, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, that was just a horrible idea. And, you know, but it was a horrible idea that that worked out. And even if it didn't work out, I, 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 I embraced it because I said, even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to learn something and I'll be better for it. So the age thing, here's what I think that young people are, it's really difficult is everyone's been pushed and beaten. So like a freaking pack mule to like grades and college admissions. And there's this right way to do things. There's a perfect face. There's a perfect body. There's a perfect resume. There's a perfect job. And, you know, Photoshop the crap out of your life until it looks like this. And then, you know, it just feeds on itself with Facebook groups or whatever, you know, Snapchat chains and, you know, your iMessage groups and everyone just, and I'm not disparaging anyone. What I'm saying, it's totally natural. It's, 
it's really the, you know, the boomers and the Gen Xers who have kind of, it's a natural evolution of here's the platonic ideal for everything. And young people have just been beaten to hue to that for so long. It feels much more like a risk when you're like, you know, I want to do something that's not what everyone says is the Photoshopped ideal of career or pathway. Um, you know, I'll tell you what, Tom Cruise wouldn't be a movie star today back then. I mean, his he's missing like one of his major teeth, right? He's, his smile's all janked up and, you know, it's where the imperfections and the mistakes are where the interesting things happen in life. And so for, 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 you know, young people, I'd say, um, I'm really sympathetic to that because I didn't have to go through that. You know, when I was younger, it was, it was still in this transition phase of there was no internet and everyone posting on the internet of here's how you should look. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a thing where it's like Asian parents saying, you know, you should play the violin and be good at math or whatever. But like, that was just my parents I had to fight against. I didn't have to fight against necessarily the whole world. So what I'd say is, is it's going to be scary because of that. But, you know, humans haven't changed. (laughs) And the world is still risky, even if you don't do anything. And so uh, every single interesting story that you ever hear, where you're like, that is awesome, is the product of someone doing something they shouldn't and taking a risk. Yeah. Love that so much. I really feel like more motivated. Like you really drove the point. Like it's the biggest risk you can take is not taking a risk, right? It's super scary. Things are different now. It's just so crazy. Everyone's, you know, whether people are getting canceled online or everything lives in perpetuity on Twitter or whatever it is. Um, Here's what I found with kind of youth behavior. I have kids and things like that is to someone who's older and didn't grow up with it, right? It seems like, oh my gosh, the world is full of knives and how do you run through the world? People your age, your listeners, like they they know how to navigate it like intuitively, right? They know what's spam and what's fake on Instagram and they know like they value authenticity and there's like a new sixth sense filter, you know, given how the world has changed. And it's really impressive. Um, you know, the world and you know, people in their twenties and thirties now skills that I, I I could train as hard as I wanted and I wouldn't be able to do everything that I know how to do. People can learn how to do right now. This whole thing that's happened, I can't learn how to do it because it's because of the pace of change around progress. Mm. You know, you guys have developed a more finely developed sense of authenticity and communication. That's AI is never going to replace that. So, uh, you know, be confident in that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Alan. Um, lastly, where can we find you online? Where can we learn more about your book? Uh, you can, I mean, look, you, uh, it's, there's an audio book. If you want to hear my voice, I narrated oh, the audio book. Are you the one narrating the entire book? I am. My oh, wife, that's awesome. I, it, this is the only place I'm going to say this. My wife says I have notes of Barack Obama in my voice uh, when I narrate. <laughs> so um, I, I can see that. Yeah. Calm. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Amazon and there's the publisher site, but, um, and there's, uh, you know, I don't even know our publisher put them in bookstores. Uh, I am going to be, I I may be the only person you ever interview on this show who is as boring as me. Um, you know, I don't have a Facebook account or a Twitter account or a snap or Snapchat or Instagram or anything like that. So, uh, what I'd say is you can, uh, Uh, go buy the book and email me and um, (laughs) and I'm on LinkedIn. That's one thing I'm on. I got on that. (laughs) So, well, wherever you're at, wherever your book is, we'll definitely link it in the show notes. So everyone can read the book, check you out, learn more about you. Um, Thank you so much for sharing today. I, I love this topic and you're, I think you brought so many interesting stories today that I really appreciate. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure being here.